Regarding the work we do at Valve and Meter, I don't take every deal that comes into the agency. I have a strategic area from which I select accounts and some things just don't fit us. The same applies to giving. There is a certain strategy we're going after. We don't need to do everything, so we use criteria based on our values and the type of giving we want to do as a team to consider whether to accept an opportunity. I try to focus on things that break cycles of poverty, addiction, and abuse because that is where my heart is. It's where I came from. As a company, we aim to enable transformative growth. We bring all of this together and focus our tithing on organizations and projects that can help make real change in someone's life. If that means helping out a local homeless shelter or school, building homes, tutoring, or some other project that fits the intention we've defined for giving, we'll consider it. I've been involved with Youth with a Mission, Homes of Hope, in the San Diego Baja area of Mexico for more than a decade. Homes of Hope builds homes for the less fortunate with the help of teams from businesses, youth groups, churches, and other organizations. In two days' time, they can build a house for someone who doesn't have one. When you get there, you typically see somebody living out of a makeshift structure they've built out of cardboard, tarpaulins, plastic bags, and whatever wood they can scrape together. I've seen families who have dug a hole in the ground and are covering themselves up at night with a tarpaulin. Within the two days you spend building a home there, you see a family transformed by generosity. This is Here We Grow, a show for growth-minded leaders looking for transformational impact, hosted by Marsha Barnes. True business leaders operate with a mindset of making a positive change in the world. In this episode of Here We Grow, we speak to Andrea East, Director of Advancement at Youth With A Mission. In their conversation, Andrea and Marsha recount several stories of the transformative power of faith and service in both a business setting and across numerous mission trips. So today we have my good friend Andrea East joining us on the podcast. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. So good to be here. Oh, good, good, good. We are going to um, talk with Andrea today about missional businesses. Andrea is the Director of Development for Youth with a Mission San Diego Baja Homes of Hope program, which we've enjoyed participating in as our family and the business as well over the years and watching you basically grow up from a little girl yeah. into this into this leadership role. Um, tell us about what Homes of Hope is doing, Andrea. Well, we love we love the way that your company and you guys have been a part. And you have seen me since a, a little girl. My parents started Homes of Hope. So I've been doing this since I was about three years old. Wow. And actually got to be a part of the first build with my dad, who um, had met a man named Sergio Gomez. He was an ex-boxer. And my dad was in Tijuana interested, how can we help? Um, the poor, how can we help the people in need here in this region? And Sergio said, what the poor really need is stable housing. Mm. And he encouraged my dad, kind of taught him the model and said, if you look for a family who owns their own land, but doesn't have the, the income to be able to build a shelter, and if you help them with that shelter, you're going to change the trajectory of their life. And so he came to Mexico to do one house brought me when I was three years old and I fell in love with the family next door and said, but dad, are we going to build a house for that family too? <laughs> and so I couldn't say no to his three-year-old daughter. He called up another team and said, please, I need you to come to Mexico and build a house for this family. And that's how Homes of Hope was born. That was 30 some odd years ago. Wow. And I guess 33, I'm getting old, <laughs> 33 years ago. And we've done over 8,000 homes in 27 different Whoa. nations since that point. Wow. 27 mm -hmm. nations, 8,000 homes. Yeah. Because a little girl says, are we going to build a home for that one? <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool that I got to be a part of that. I, I want to just say one other thing about that because I don't want to take all the credit. Um, obviously, my parents did an amazing work, but... On that build, when I now that I'm older and I have my own three-year-old child and my own <laughs> husband, and I look at what happened on that build when my dad brought me down, I imagine that I was kind of abandoned as a three-year-old girl <laughs> on the work site. Uh, if you know my dad, you know that that is the case. And this lady that was living in a bus that had crashed on the side of the hill in extreme poverty 
must have taken me in because I became friends with her kids. I remember Mm -hmm. going into the bus and being a part of their family for a few days. And so I did have an impact on that second home of hope, but it was really what I like to say. It was really Maria who had a heart of hospitality and said, if I don't take care of this girl, probably nobody will. And (laughs) and that's really why Homes of Hope was started, I think, because of the hospitality of a woman that was living in poverty. That's fantastic. Did she get a home? She got a home. She got the second home of hope. That was the that was the family. That's a lovely. Now you have a metaphor you use that describes how the ministry works and and how it's, yeah. what its cause is. Why don't you? Yeah, share we that love with us? to tell the starfish story mm-hmm. as a really good example. So, the story goes that there was a young boy walking along the beach. Um, after a large storm had crossed and he's walking and he notices that there's thousands of starfish lying along the shore that had been washed up. So he bends down, he picks up a starfish, he throws it back in the water. And as he's doing this, an adult walks down to the beach and says, son, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm throwing these starfish back into the water. And he says, there's thousands of starfish. How could you possibly make a difference? And he picks up a starfish, looks at it, throws it back into the water and said, it matters to this one. And um, a lot of times when we look at global poverty, especially if you want to look at it on a global scale, it's overwhelming. How could you possibly make a difference? And that paralyzes us. Um, But as a ministry, we want to be like that little boy and pick up one more and say, well, it matters to this one. So that's why we keep going. Wow. It's impressive work. And having participated in it for many years, Um, It's overwhelming, the impact that it's having. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're in poverty-stricken parts of Mexico. Mm -hmm. We're building homes. Why is it important for folks to have a home in Mexico? The communities where we build in are largely communities where people have immigrated or migrated into that area. A lot of times because of just extreme desperation in southern Mexico, Central America, So they come to Tijuana and Sonata. There's actually jobs in those regions. So they'll come with the hope of a better life, but then they get here and they have no family system that would back them up. They don't have grandparents they can live with. They don't have a community of people that they know. And so they're really left alone, but they want to be in a stable community. And so every time we build a home for one family, we're creating a a unit of stability in that community so that they can then grow and flourish and do the hard work of pulling themselves out of poverty. And it's been really cool to see year after year um, when you go back and visit a family, the first time you go back to visit, maybe say three months out, maybe they've got a refrigerator. That means they can store their food longer. It means they've got electricity. It means they're slowly doing better. And then maybe the next time they've put tile on the floor, they've built a bathroom onto the side, but their their lives keep getting better and better. Um, you know, the house that we give them is just a really cool starting point. It's awesome. Prior to them being in that house, most of them are living on dirt. Mm-hmm. So now there's health issues, right? Yeah, we've done we've we've been able to see some really cool studies on the five benefits mm-hmm. of a home, and one of those benefits, like you mentioned, is health. And I, this is probably the most fascinating to me. But when you're living on a dirt floor, you have your instance of asthma that goes through the roof because right. you're always breathing in dirt. But then what you're also doing is you're ingesting dirt with your food, and so diarrhea goes up. Mm. And so you look at someone living in poverty on a dirt floor with no ventilation, they have asthma, and they're constantly dehydrated from diarrhea. So now tell that person, you go work a 12-hour hard labor job or try and go to school and learn in spite of your poverty and flourish in life. I mean, none of us flourish when we're thirsty. <laughs> like, right. um, so, so when we build a home for a family and we just putting in a cement floor and windows for ventilation completely changes their health trajectory. We once had a mom who said, I always thought my husband was lazy because mm-hmm. he would miss so much work. And then we got to this home and it's been six months and he hasn't missed a day of work. Wow. And she realized he was just really sick. So that's one of the one of the benefits we like to talk about. And some some other things that we've seen through just global housing studies is that someone who receives a home is three times more likely to stay in school and they'll stay on average two years longer. Oh wow. So that's giving the kids a really a a push forward in their education, which we all know is so, so important and valuable. And then you look at 
economically, of course. The homes that we build would take about 10 years of savings for these families to be able to replicate. And so we're able to give that to them on in a two-day period. And then for the next 10 years, all of that excess money that they're able to save can go to other investments Mm -hmm. into their family and their health and their work. And then you look at the uh, emotional impact, which is a little bit harder to quantify, but I just was watching a, a video we're making about a family who the little kids after the dedication said, mom, I can't wait till school starts again because now we can invite our teacher over to see our house. And the pride of home ownership really impacts the family. And Mm -hmm. that um, has, I'll have a cool story. Tell me in a second, I want to tell you the story of Esperanza that uh, really ties into that. But the, the fifth impact that we really value is that there's a spiritual impact because we do this in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we want every family to know that whether they're Christian or whether they're not Christian, that doesn't matter. But what we want them to know is that there's a God who loves them and cares about them and desires good things for them. And that's what we always communicate as we build. And the purpose of the organization is stated as Engaging a broken world in God's generosity. Awesome. Yep. That's our, yeah, that's our, our why. Yeah. Uh To (laughs) engage a broken world with God's generosity. Yeah. You folks are all in and it's hard work and it's very impressive to see. And so it's important to know where, where that's coming from and your why. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Tell us about Esperanza. I think um, hearing. This is one of my favorite stories. Yeah. Geez, I I think it was probably about 15 years ago that this story started. And the government actually reached out to our ministry, uh, the local government there in Tijuana, and said, We have a family that is in such desperate need. Uh, If you're not able to build for them, we're going to have to remove the children from their parents uh, because their living situation was so difficult. And they told us that the reason this came to their, or the the reason the government stepped in is because the 14 year old daughter, whose name is Esperanza, which means hope in English. um, She had attempted to commit suicide just a few weeks before. Oh wow! And her, she had told her parents, you know, I just thought it'd be easier to feed the family if I wasn't here. And she was one of five. They were splitting a little packet of Topper Ramen every night for dinner. That was all they could afford. Five people, one packet? Five kids. Oh, my goodness. Family of seven. And when we stepped in, it was a really difficult situation. And a family that's living like that, you know, the mom and dad are not necessarily thriving from the beginning. And the the children were sick. It was really hard um, to see them in those conditions. So. We had a team, actually a local team here from Indy, came, um, a business here, came down, built their home. It was such a cool experience because it was just this radical life-saving transformation. I remember going back just a few weeks after we finished their home and the littlest um, boy in the family, he was two at the time, had had just horrible red blisters all over his face from sun exposure, you know? And we we go back and his, he just had like baby soft cheeks like you would expect from a two year old. Right. And um, you could see that the family began to thrive and we helped the mom start a tamale business. And we really wanted to wrap our arms around this family. Um, and we loved them. I loved them. I visited quite often, but about six months in, the story took a turn and we we go to visit them and the neighbors tell us, well, they've They've sold their house and left town. Mm. And it wasn't like, a, oh, we're, we're moving on to something better because we allow, allow our families to sell the house. It's their house. It's a mm. gift. Um, but this was a, they owed a debt to a drug lord and needed to get out oh, of town. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And it was devastating because, you know, when you serve, you always want to see a good result. Right. Like you don't want to know or you don't want to see that sometimes humans make bad decisions and we still serve mm-hmm. because it's, they're still worth it even right. when, when that happens. But it was a difficult situation. We could never get a hold of them. And I tried really hard um, because I really, really loved Esperanza. Well, fast forward like 10 years wow. and... Esperanza comes to our campus where we are, and this was um, just as the peak of COVID was going away. So we hadn't been building for several months, and the campus was basically closed down. I was in Indiana here, and 
Esperanza meets up with my mom who was there on the campus and said, I really want to talk to Andrea. I don't know who this is. I'm FaceTiming, you know, this young, beautiful Mexican woman on the phone. She pulls out a picture of the team that built for her. And that's how I finally recognized oh her goodness. and remembered, you know, it jogged my memory. Right. And she said, I just had to come and thank you. And she said, I was so ashamed when my family sold the home that you gave to us. And I, I couldn't believe that they had done that. But every time I struggled in my life, every time I wanted to give up, every time I thought I wasn't good enough, I would look at this picture of this team of people that came to build my home. And I would know that I should keep fighting and that I should keep going because all of them believed in me. And um, she later told us that she was just about to graduate from nursing school, oh, wow. which is just like a miracle right? for this girl who probably would have never finished middle school. Right. She's graduate now, you know, now fast forward, she's graduated from nursing school. She's thriving, doing so well. And it wasn't the material shelter of the home that changed her life. It was the team. The act of came. generosity, right? The act of generosity, the act of, I see you, I care right. about you. This is not what God has for you. Mm -hmm. He has something better. And she clung to that right. and believed it. And that's right. what I think with Homes of Hope, I have this kind of thought about it that so many times we define the poor by their lack, what right. they don't have. Instead of defining them by their potential mm -hmm. and what God has created them for. And um, the way my dad likes to say it is, you see the poor, I see an army. But we want to see the those who are living in poverty be given the tools that they need to rise up and change their communities. Mm -hmm. And actually, 26 of our staff grew up in a home of Hope House and are wow. working now full time with us and doing that. But even thousands more have received a home and have really taken up the charge to do something for their community. And it made me think of, I loved reading your book. Oh, I just, you. <laughs> I laughed and I cried and I was challenged and encouraged. But there's this one, you know, line, which I'm sure you have burned into you uh, much more than I do. But you say here, the day I lost just about everything and found myself on my knees, crying in my living room and holding my babies changed everything. I was able to quiet my mind long enough to hear what God had been trying to tell me all my life. I am strong. I am capable. And I have all the tools I will ever need to do the work he put me on this planet to accomplish. Like, what a beautiful truth that you learned that. Not in your greatest success, but in your greatest failure moment, you know, right. or your your greatest trial I see that for our families as well, that we, that through the adversity that they've lived, mm -hmm. God has been raising them up and blessing them. And this material gift of a home is just a part right. of releasing them into what he has for them. The fundamental difference of what I had in that moment to what a lot of folks miss is I knew I was created for more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had that yeah. truth. You, 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 there's most people don't think they've got what it takes, right? Mm. But I knew that part. I just didn't know why it kept breaking, which was because I wasn't, I wasn't looking to God for it. <laughs> mm. So then I can see where that's very true of the folks you're encountering as well. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's interesting that it took so long for that story to redeem itself with you too. I know, mm. I know you're not, attached to the outcome. So many people get yeah. attached to when they give, they're expecting this thing to be this certain way and you just have to release attachment to it. Right. And, um, but the story got redeemed after 10 years went by, yeah. right? And this person shows back up breathing yeah. new joy into you. Yeah. Totally. And the timing was so of the Lord because the next day we were scheduled to build our first house post COVID. Right. And there was, you know, several people on our staff who were very concerned, like, is it worth it to go back in the community if we could spread sickness? Right. You know, like, which was a, which is a valid concern. Like, there's a risk. And um, Esperanza stepping onto our campus, like, galvanized all of us to realize, like, it is 100% worth it mm -hmm. to make the impact that we're making so that future generations don't have to grow up the right. same way. right. So yeah, she was a real a real like directional piece for us to to take up the charge again. 
I've worked with other missionaries, other clergy, other pastors over the years. You guys work so hard. Your, you, your staff, your parents, the leaders there, you are so in love with the work and the calling mm-hmm. that God's put on your life. Um, where do you, where does that energy come from? You know, you, you guys put it, you leave it all on the floor, right? It's, uh-huh. it's, it's commendable. Sometimes I worry that you don't rest enough, but, <laughs> but how does, yeah. how is it that this, this ministry, not just in you, it's not just your dad, it's not just yeah, your mom, no. it's hundreds of missionaries who are working in this cause, both in the Baja Peninsula and the other posts that you've commissioned as well mm-hmm. out of Homes of Hope. What's, what, what is it that's triggering that? Yeah, I mean, I think there, you, I could say a million things right, right now, but the one that's coming to my mind is really the strong relationship. Mm-hmm. So your relationship to the Lord where He is communicating to you, like, it's worth it. You know, like mm-hmm. the things that you don't always see, the fruit that you want to see right away, but then God communicates it's worth it through people like Esperanza or, you know, like— He'll give us those stories that help give us the energy to keep going. But a relationship, so relationship with God, but relationship with each other. You know, our staff are really tight knit and we care for each other. And if one person has a medical need and they can't cover the cost, everybody donates. And Mm -hmm. I've had people come, they're just blown away. Like, how do you all live in such a in such a way that, you know, one person doesn't have enough. They don't have to worry because we'll take care of it. So. Mm As a staff, we really take care of each other. And then we have such a strong relationship with the teams and a bond with those who come and serve alongside of us and give that new, fresh breath of air. You know, like I I think if we were trying to build all the house by ourselves as a staff, we would burn out really quickly. But because every weekend we have more people coming and relationships that don't just last on the weekend, but then you become friends and you knit your lives together mm-hmm. with other people who are championing you. And I think that really gives us longevity. Right. Your team is people from all different countries. You yeah. have now have quite a few Mexican born missionaries that are involved as yeah. well. Um, in doing this, as long as I've been doing it the last 15 years with you folks, um, I've encountered folks when they first land in the ministry, right? And now uh-huh. I've been walking alongside of them for 15 years and they're 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 growing up and getting married and having babies and starting other adjacent ministries to Hope Homes of Hope. Um but like Yessie and Amanda. Yeah. Um I mean I was Yessie was on my build team shoot back in 2008, I think. Wow, cool. And um, my boys just really liked him a lot and yeah. connected with him as we would revisit and and now they're running Hope Zone in Tijuana. Yeah, and Hope Zone is just so cool. So they chose the hardest and darkest corner of the red light district in Tijuana, which is the largest red light district in North America. And just they started with prayer walks and they said, Lord, what can we do? Wow. And on one of those prayer walks, they met a, a young mom who was actually selling her daughter into prostitution, um, just a, a very young child. And um, that that encounter is what led them to start a ministry first for children to help encourage them to to choose a lifestyle that would be a safe one in their adulthood. So it was a preventative ministry. Um, and then that grew and the mom started saying, well, do you have anything for us? And then the dads were like, well, what about us? Yeah. So now they have an entire family ministry uh, just focused on being a light in that community and their right working on building a community center, uh, which will be so awesome so that they can do just more in-depth training and teaching and education. Right now it's all outside, right? just in an open area. So. Wow. Yeah. Incredible ministry. Um, Oscar and Kirsty, another couple of young folks we met on my first build. They were both assigned to the build. And I uh, just was kind of watching between them at the time. And I said to Kirsty, is that your boyfriend? And she goes, <laughs> no. And I go, not yet, and sure enough, <laughs> now they're married, and they have five kids, four or five kids? Four. Four. Yeah, just yeah. had their, their fourth little baby. Yeah. One of the things that's been great with working with them, you know, we would send them support, but they also prayed for us, and we're, we're actively involved in our lives as well. Mm. Um, and Oscar, I think, has done an incredible piece of work with noticing the young kids that were skipping school, 
Yeah. And they needed something to do. And so he invited them into his woodworking shop that he had and yeah. trained them to do woodworking. Yeah. So Oscar, I mean, really brilliant what what he's done, but mm-hmm. he start, he's engaged all these young adults to come and build simple cabinetry. And then he sells that cabinetry to the teams who come to build homes right. and they can put them in the home. And then he's able to use that money to increase their ministry mm-hmm. and um, cover, you know, the expense of bringing the kids to the shop and all of the tools and even... He just brought a group of those kids to Costa Rica right. to serve with the Homes of Hope team in Costa Rica. That's awesome. And the Homes of Hope team there was like, wow, like we we never had this vision for our young people that they would be the missionaries and that right. they would go and serve and do. And so I think it was a real, a real big inspirational thing for them. But Kirsty yeah. and Oscar have put it all all on the line. And given their their hearts and their lives to 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 a lot of communities, but one in particular, and they've actually are starting a community center there now. Oh, nice. So they'll be closer in um, rather than bringing people to the campus. Yeah. But um, so beautiful to begin to see the fruit of right. that. Yeah. And you know, boys not having boys not going to school and not having a thing to do is a recipe for a trip, quick trip into drugs or yeah. some sort of nonsense. You know, right? they just be, and they just become so vulnerable to the cartels mm-hmm. who are right. always recruiting young men who don't have a lot to lose. Yeah. So, And in exchange, they get encouragement from fascinating adults, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and just wonderful, wonderful engagement there. But they also are taught a vocation that they can lean on yeah. in the future, too. Yeah, and even beyond something that's been so interesting to me recently is the idea of soft skills and yeah. beyond maybe they won't be a carpenter, but they'll know how to arrive on time, mm-hmm. take simple criticism, mm-hmm. follow through with what they said they're going to do. Mm-hmm. And those sort of things are not being developed um, very well in a lot of these impoverished communities because people are just surviving. Right. Um, so I think that's that's kind of a gift that we don't even realize right. how big it is. It's remarkable. Yeah. So over the years, um, I've, I'll be going next month on my 21st build with mm-hmm. your team. And um, so I've, my family has gone and it just had an extraordinary impact on my children. Um, they're looking forward to going again. We're um, Cody, my daughter-in-law, is seven months pregnant, so it's going to be a minute <laughs> before she'll yeah. be able to go. But, but um, both boys just had, and Cody had, incredible experiences there that deepen their faith, you know, mm-hmm. and, and show them, you know, what poverty really looks like and, and, and their values really improved a lot after having that experience. Um, you know, I've led lots of business people down there over the years, taken teams from the businesses. Um, in recent years, I've taken other businesses down mm-hmm. um, for some of your events, worked on the board there, um, supported missionaries, um, but the deepening my faith, the deepening of my faith in a place that I've gone to serve, mm. there is no place else that works that way for me. You know, that mm. that um, that coming and helping and volunteering, I learn something new about God or God's relationship with me every time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you really connect to God in a u- unique way through service because right. you're you're literally being his hands and feet and even people who don't know the lord will come back being like that was the most spiritual experience i've ever had right yeah we recently just sent our first build team out from valve and meter to um uh to get build a home um i also you know um custom concrete sent a yeah. team they were on the president's build last year and mm-hmm. and they took a team of their uh, their employees um, about three months ago, I think. Yeah. They had some interesting things happen on their trip. It really, really, um, really moved them and came in. Their, their, a couple of their team members came in and shared with us here at Balvin Meter. Um, do you want to talk about what happened with them? Yeah, yeah. I just, I love this story because not only is it a cool story, but it came from the mouth of the sweetest 12 year old boy you've ever met. But we actually asked on Marsha's good advice, I asked him to share to a group of people that we are inviting to a fundraiser. And so Nolan comes up to share his experience with Homes of Hope. And he's talking about the things that he saw while he was there, like really articulate young man, I'm thinking this whole time. But he ends with this story about a young man named Javi. 
And Javi was a little neighbor kid f- where they were building out in the community. And Javi came that first day and stayed with them and worked with them and fell in love with the team and the team fell in love with Javi. And as they were driving away, they looked and they saw that Javi was kind of off to the side with his hands in his face weeping. Mm -hmm. So they pull the van over and the team leader gets out and, you know, tries to talk to him and encourage him. And all of them are just gutted. I mean, they've had this wonderful experience. They've given a family a home. It's been beautiful. But what about Javi? And um, so Nolan says that he and his dad just kept thinking, like, what if Javi's the starfish that we couldn't get? You know, going back to the story that I told at the beginning of the starfish, like, what if Javi's the starfish that got away? And they sat with that for quite a while until the the just a few minutes before Nolan shared with us, with our group, he and his dad realized, what if I was the starfish and Javi threw me back in the water? And what they meant by that is because of that encounter with Javi and the way that they loved him, they have this new deep desire to continue to serve and to continue to go and continue to bring transformation in people's lives that they would have never had had they not had that beautiful relationship with Javi. And so Javi has given them a gift that will, I think will lead to some really beautiful things in the future. And I think that's why our ministry is so cool because it's not just about, I went to build a house for you, but you go and you learn and you grow and you experience something and you come closer to God and everyone benefits. Right. Yeah, knowing uh, Chris, um, Nolan's dad, um, there's also an important part of that. They, their team and they had their eyes wide open, right? Mm. They, weren't just, they weren't just looking at, we're building a house. They were paying attention to what was going on around them, you know, and engaging the hobbies and the family members yeah. and, the te- and your team as well. Just incredible to see. I mean, I know what I've experienced through your ministry, but when I see others multiplying it, it always gives me a great deal of joy. (laughs) Yeah, totally. On our podcast, typically I ask at the end of the podcast, we value in the book and here at Valve and Meter transformation Mm -hmm. of seeing a noticeable change in substance or form. And um, so I always ask people, can you share with me, you work and everything you're doing is in transformation, but if you could share with me a time when you've seen something transform in someone. Yeah, I think I'd love to share a story of when I felt a transformation in my life. And it was with you, Marcia, Um, you know, many years ago, I got invited to a a conference is it called, I guess, mm-hmm. a convention, convention yeah. that Defenders was running for their employees. And so mm-hmm. Defenders brought over 5,000 employees and families to build homes. Am I, is that number correct? Right, I think, right. yeah. Uh, just became an incredible part of the Homes of Hope culture, but it mm-hmm. also became an incredible part of the Defenders culture. Right. So I was hosting a booth at, at a convention one year. I met my husband there, so it was a pretty good year for oh, me. Oh, that is a good year. Um, I didn't realize yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> But something else brought that transformation that day. And I I went into the convention and you were on stage, Marsha, and you were sharing, uh, going through a a series that you had done with your staff on bringing transformation in their own lives. And it's something that you mentioned in the book that was really a catalyst for you of focusing, growing yourself more than growing your business. And I think you guys, the defenders, then coined the phrase, um, Businesses don't grow, people do. Right. And that that phrase, in turn, really transformed our ministry because we began applying that to the missionaries. How can we grow our staff right. and invest in them? But on this particular day, um, this was before all that happened, I believe, and you were up on the stage sharing with staff who had seen transformation in their lives because of a, de- a good decision they made, and you were encouraging them. And there was this anointing on you like I had never seen before like you were the the this amazing missionary in a field that nobody else could reach but you you are the CEO of this huge company every and you know, like it's so successful doing really well but the focus is not on that success it wasn't about how cool you were even though at that moment I was like oh my gosh she's so cool I want to know her 
But the focus was on what is the Lord doing in the lives of my employees? Really, it was mm-hmm. a holy moment. Right. And I sat there as a missionary thinking, like, I never realized how amazing the mission field is mm-hmm. for a business leader. And to, to see you in leading in such a beautiful way, in that way, as a strong woman of God, really encouraged me and in my own growth and my own leadership that— you know, more than what I believed is possible is possible. And uh, the impact that you were able to have just because of your yes was so cool to see. Well, thank you, Andrew. That's very, very kind. And as a reminder that, you know, you always have to make sure you're doing something good when others are watching because <laughs> here, here's this young lady watching in the, in, the, in the room and getting an impact that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, that what we were doing in that event was um, transformation is a here to there type of story. Mm. You were here and you went there. And so we had challenged the team in the months leading up to the um, convention to compete in um, producing their here to there story. Mm. Um, they could pick any type of thing they were going to work on. There were a lot of folks that selected weight loss. Um, there were folks who selected things like um, keeping my blood sugar at the correct amount. Mm. Um, there were folks that became debt free. Um, cool. There were folks who um, were going through um, training. You're know, like going back to school or taking a course or something mm-hmm. like that. And then they wrote about what they had done. And if they were selected as a finalist, we sent them on a um, shopping spree and got them a personal stylist and sent them to the yeah. Lowry. You know, David's come and built homes yeah, yeah. with you before, and so he would take care of their hair and their makeup if needed. And and so they got new out, they got new wardrobe and they got made up and then they had their before picture and their after picture and they were telling their story of what had happened with them. Oh yeah. 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 I mean there were folks that had lost a hundred pounds, you know, got rid of, you know, two hundred thousand dollars of debt that they had, you know. It was it, it was the non work goal. Yeah. You know, not how much money you're gonna make or promotion, but what are you doing? To work on yourself. And just the way that you celebrated people in that moment was what really impacted me of just like the the ministry that we can have just by simply celebrating right. other people and mm-hmm. championing what God is doing in their life. Right. In any pl- it doesn't matter what platform you're on. You it's know? that focus of the potential and not the lack, right? Yeah. I mean, it, the thing that was touching me, I think, that you might have observed from your seat was the way they carried themselves when they mm. came out on stage, you couldn't even recognize some yeah. of these people. I'm like, is that Loretta? <laughs> <laughs> and she was just gorgeous, but it was the way she was walking, you know, was with, just mm. with such confidence. Yeah. Um, Alan, and I guess, remember, still remember all those people. <laughs> yeah. Alan and Bobby and Susie and, and all the rest. But yeah, it was, um, it was incredible to re- read what they had written and what had happened to them too, and the evidence of it, you know? Mm. So it was cool. So Andrea, you know, obviously I've been talking about the ways that I've participated and you mm-hmm. have you have folks coming to you all the time to experience this. What's the best thing to do if someone's listening today and they want to find out more about Homes of Hope and uh, and talk with someone about maybe going on a build or supporting the ministry financially? How should they reach out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a great way to start is on our website. So that's uh, ymsandiegobaja.org and then you can choose Homes of Hope as one of the ministries that we do and you can see there you can watch videos you can see more about who we are and then the best way to come is to come and build a home and experience right. with us you know um, you got to do that with a team yeah. so we don't really take individuals but there's especially if you're in indie I mean churches groups mm-hmm. companies mm-hmm. We're hosting people all the time. So we would be totally happy to connect you with someone in your area who's already arranging a trip. You can tag along with them and experience it. And then the people who come the most often are the ones who say, I'm going to figure out every group of people I know in my life and I'm going to drag them to Mexico with me and we're going to build a house (laughs) together. So we've had Boy Scout groups. We've had sports teams. We have churches. We have Bible study fellowships. We have, you know, any sort of group, you name it, of about 15 people or more, you know, um, can come and build a house. And the way that we operate, we have the teams cover all their own travel expenses and the cost of the home. 
And uh, we take care of all the rest. So we have all the tools there. Mm -hmm. We pick you up in buses and you you stay with us on our campus. We cook all the food for you. We take care of everything. All you have to do is show up and have a current passport. The campus is absolutely gorgeous. And the hospitality is off the charts. The, the mm -hmm. food is lovely. You'll be a little bit embarrassed that you feel like you're kind of maybe at a resort <laughs> And on a mission trip. So. <laughs> we we do we do like to make it a low barrier. Yeah, you know, right. like there's some there's some people who do it and they uh, other ministries, you stay in a tent, you bring your own food, you mm -hmm. know, you purify your own water with one of those straws. <laughs> that's great. That's not. But no. it's not necessarily not <laughs> our target market. We want to be we, we call it full service missions, but we want people to be able to jump off the plane, be comfortable. And because the focus needs to be on serving and loving, not on how, how much you can rough it. Right. So so if you want to rough it, you can go on a camping trip later. But this is really so that all your focus and energy can be on building relationship with the family, with the people you came with, with our staff, and really blessing somebody else. Yeah. So. Great. I highly encourage it. If you have any questions, you can ask me about it too. Yeah. You can send an email. We can put it in the comments of yeah. this podcast, but hope at YOMSDB.org gets directly to me, and um, I'm happy to answer questions and help connect you. Fantastic. So. Thank you, Andrea, for joining yeah. us today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for Here We Grow. This show is proudly brought to you by Valve and Meter Performance Marketing. Be sure to check out the show notes for exclusive content that will help you become a transformational leader. For more, visit mathbeforemarketing.com slash podcast.